Okay, my name is Miles Berry. My day job these days is training the next generation of outstanding teachers at the University of Roehampton. I've been doing that for about three years now. Before that, I did 18 years in four different independent schools, as it happens most recently as an uh, independent school head teacher, as a prep school head. Um, did three years as that prematurely grey as a result. So, um, having a well of a time now, one of, the, I mean, one of the other things I do is as chair of NACE's board of management. NACE is the ICT subject association. If your heads of ICT or whatever aren't members, please go back to your schools and encourage them to join. It's a great community practice, great way of sort of sharing ideas around ICT. What I'm going to try and do over the next half hour is talk about 30 different um, ICT-related innovations, some of which are technology, some of which are much more in the sort of realm of how we use the stuff in the classroom. So I'm going to go through this at a fairly fast pace. Hopefully there will be a chance for questions afterwards, but if not, come and grab me, come and talk about these things. Does that sound all right? Okay. This is where I used to work. This is the last school I was part head of, Alton Convent School. I was head of the prep school, which is the bit down here. Um, what I want to think about is sort of so many aspects of the school life. So I want to talk a little about the sort of thing which happens in the IT room, which was, was this bit here, the sort of back office from a technical point of view. I want to talk a lot about what happens in classrooms. I also want to talk a little about what happens in the library and thinking about access to learning outside of sort of more formal classroom-like spaces, um, talk a little about what happens outside beyond the school. So the website is a portal for sharing the work of the school, the life of the school with a wider community, and also children's learning outside beyond the school. So that's vaguely where we're heading. Um, so 30 technologists, 30 minutes, give or take. Virtualization. This involves running a wee bit of software on your servers, which turn them into multiple servers. So right down at the sort of bare metal level of the hardware, you have a tiny, tiny little bit of software. For an example, is this Zen stuff that's on the screen behind me. And that says, OK, this computer is going to pretend to be lots of other different computers, three, four, five. The machines we've got in school these days are so powerful, they can do more than one thing at the same time. Lots of advantages to this. Firstly, if the thing breaks, you just take that image of the virtual server, put it onto another bit of hardware, and carry on just as you were. So the sort of redundancy there. And also efficiency in terms of using the hardware far, far more effectively. So we're sort of taking the hardware and making it run as if it were software. Thin client solutions been around for a while now. We were doing this sort of stuff back at Alton three, four years ago now. So we had one big, serious, powerful machine, sort of, you know, fa fast, expensive, big box, and then 20 really, really rubbish computers that the second senior school had handed down and said, we're going to throw these away unless you can find a use for them. Those computers did absolutely nothing. They were just sat there as dumb terminals, listening to what that big box in the background was doing. So you had 18 children, 20 children around the outside of the room, each using what they thought of as their own computer, but none of the processing being done on that machine, all of that being done on the big um, server that they were acting as thin clients to. Sort of going back to the old days of, of the computer there is just terminal with big machines in the background. So again, cost savings because the thin clients would otherwise have been thrown away. Also, ma maintenance savings, tremendously good for that because there was only one computer that you needed to fix, only one computer that you needed to maintain, only one computer that you needed to update. The dumb machines around the edge of the room just took whatever instructions they were given from that. Um, worked so well, it really did. And then we moved to getting rid of the servers completely and moving to something like the Chromebook. Anybody seen Chromebooks? Chromebooks not as sexy as an iPad by any stretch of the imagination. Looks like a laptop, behaves like a laptop, but again, no processing being done on that computer itself. All of the processing being done out on Google's cloud. All you have on the Chromebook is a web browser. You need a really, really good internet connection, you need really, really good Wi-Fi, but if you've got both of those things, then you just use the, the web to do all of the things which previously we'd done on laptops. Um, what's the going rate for one of these things? £300 outright, £15 a month with the maintenance contract from Google. Anything goes wrong with it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Any other Chromebook just takes its place, does the job exactly like the Chromebook that you're on. So you've got that sort of very, very high level of fault tolerance built into this. If you're willing to trust the things into the hands of children young people, they take them home, carry on doing exactly the same work, 
as they were doing at school because they're connecting to the same big Google Cloud server with Google Mail, Google Docs, all of those Google applications running on that. 3D printing, more sort of back office heavy tech stuff. Anybody doing any 3D printing in their school? There are expensive ways of doing it. It's really, really interesting technology. So think of the role that printing plays in your institution, then think about what you could do when it becomes physical objects that you're printing out. So all of those lovely design and technology projects create the thing on the screen, get the computer to fabricate it for you. All of those tiny little fiddly little components, if you've got the design, the specification file for that 3D printer, make the thing for you. This one is called a RepRap machine, and it's ever so slightly scary in that it can make about 90% of its own components. So the little bits of plastic or resistive material that you've got going on here were made by other RepRap machines. We're not quite at the point of these von Neumann tiny nanobots that can rep replicate themselves, but this is coming pretty close to that, okay, at a fairly larger scale than the nanobots. And then, of course, the tablets. Anybody using iPads in their schools? Okay, no longer quite such an innovative thing, but this is, this is probably, you know, story of the year type stuff. School's doing really interesting, exciting things with these. In terms of one-to-one -one access to technology for children, what a brilliant device. Particularly if you've got young children in your school, in an early years setting, such an intuitive interface. <laughs> you've got children who are going into reception now, looking at the computer in the corner of the classroom, touching the screen, and really quite disappointed when it doesn't react to what their finger does on it because they're so used to mummy's phone, daddy's phone, their iPads at home. Not too bad to manage the things in school either. There's nice little bits of software from our friends at Apple which allow you to configure the whole set. Still not worked out perfectly, much more a sort of consumer level bit of technology than something which has been designed for school. But so lovely to see the sorts of things which children, which teachers are doing with these. And of course you've got access to the web, anything which runs on the web apart from Flash, perhaps, you can get running on the, the iPad, but you've also got lots and lots of other things in there too. Not just an access to information, but also a great tool for children's creativity. The camera built in, the movie editing software built in, lovely, lovely devices. I think we're going to see a number of schools moving away from the whole, we need to provide laptops, we need to provide ICT suites. And in terms of access to technology across the curriculum as a tool to enhance teaching learning, the tablet is, for many, the way forward. Other models are available. It's not just the iPad. So you have the whole Android tablet, Samsung, for instance, and then released or uh, launched at the beginning of this week, uh, Microsoft's version of this, slightly later to the market than the other people, but really interesting idea of let's put a keyboard into the cover for it. It's the one thing which is hard to do on the, the iPad is the, the, the typing stuff. So um, nice idea there from Microsoft. And then, of course, I think Valerie Thomas is going to talk about this in this room just a little bit later on, this notion of, well, so many of the children we're teaching, so many of the young people that we're working with, have their own phone. The phone in their pocket is more powerful than the machine which took man to the moon 43 years ago. You know, what do we do with, with, with those computers where we threw man at the moon? What do we do with these computers where we threw, throw birds at pigs or whatever? That you have all of this technology which children could bring in with them if we let them. Now, for many schools, that's you know, a step too far a little bit scary. My students are really horrified by the notion that you know, the children that they're working with could be bringing in their phone. But think, you know, why not use the technology which they have there? Isn't that a more cost-effective way of doing things if you can either trust them or come up with some systems to, I don't know, limit, restrict, monitor the sort of thing which they're doing with these devices? That, that's, there are interesting issues to work out there as to exactly where that balance between learner autonomy, learner control over their own device, and our wish to have a sort of safe, sensible learning environment. Interesting the stuff from Ofsted, Michael Wilshaw, the HMCI, saying, don't think there should be any mobile phones in any schools. That's what he did at his school. But yet, you look at the ICT subject guidance for ICT, and Ofsted saying, in order to get outstanding for leadership management in ICT, you should have a policy about mobile phones. You should be making use of this sort of mobile technology, which is what we all do, I would think. Um, and then, of course, for both the Chromebooks, for the iPads, for the BYOD solutions, the connectivity stuff really does matter. You need a really good internet connection. You need that really good Wi-Fi in the classroom. All of the rest, children, by and large, or we can sort out using other methods, you know, but the thing which we have to have 
is that sort of connectivity to the web. If you're going to use the Chromebooks, then you need that fast connection out to Google's server. Nothing else is going to work when it comes to that sort of thing. The one school which went to a Chromebook deployment found they had to leave the regional broadband consortiums provided internet service because it wasn't good enough went with a commercial provider and saved lots of money about that. How much are you paying for your internet connections? You don't have to answer that now, but do look carefully at that line in the budget. You don't have to go with the RBC, the Regional Broadband Consortium, the local authority provided solution. You can take control of that yourself. And if you're willing to do that sort of monitoring, filtering, keeping it safe stuff yourselves, then there are significant savings that you could make there. Interesting notion of the, the MiFi box. This phone will act as a Wi-Fi hotspot. If you're going down the BYOD route and you're letting children bring in phones, then they can create their own Wi-Fi network, providing an internet connection to other devices in the room, bypassing the school's filtering, bypassing the school's server. You can't rely on the sort of technical solutions to monitor that, to stop nasty things happening. It's got to be a people-based solution of, look, oh, we're here to learn. This is the sort of thing we do. Um, digressing and talking a little about Roehampton, you know, we, broadly speaking, I've never seen a screen which says you're not allowed access to this page. Yet I've never walked into any of our ICT rooms and seen students looking at things which I would regard as inappropriate. Why not? Because they'd be so fearfully embarrassed to be found doing that by any of their friends. If so, at 18, why not at 16? Why not at 14? What's the difference there? Um, and then, of course, the Raspberry Pi. Anybody got one of these? Anybody got? We put our names on the list. Very good. <laughs> okay. Have you had the email saying you can order one yet? No. It will come. It will come. So this is, I mean, it's an astonishing bit of kit. UK firm, um, or UK charitable foundation, Raspberry Pi, uh, built around the ARM chip, which was the, one of the great secret success stories of British, IC to, British IT. So the, the, the people that brought you the BBC Micro, Acorn, went on to develop this really, really clever architecture for a, a silicon chip, a central processing unit, based around a really small, simple set of instructions running very, very quickly, running at very low power. At the time, anybody thought, oh, big deal. Everybody went with Intel, great success story. We know all of those chips inside our big computers. Then comes the mobile phone thing, where you need simple, sm small, very power efficient processors. And so 98% of the world of mobile phones using a British design chip right in the middle of them. And why don't we hear about this? So that's what's on the middle, in the middle of the Raspberry Pi there. £25 for one of these things, and it is a proper computer. You can play Quake on it. You can watch HD video on one of these things. And that's what it looks like when you unpack the thing. So you plug in a monitor, you plug in a keyboard, you plug in a mouse, you plug in a wired internet connection. This won't work with your Wi-Fi. And there you have a desktop computer ready to go. It does very little out of the box. The idea is that children, young people, will learn to program on one of these things. But you could do it for all sorts of other things. Are you going to replace your ICT suite with these things? Probably not. If you've got another room you want to kit out as an ICT suite, then think carefully about whether one of these might, or whether 30 of those, might provide another way of doing that at £25 each. More exciting still, put one of those into the hands of all of the children. Let them take those home, plug them into the screens, <laughs> plug them into the keyboards at home and see what they can do with those, making the, the learning something which is in their hands rather than ours. And then moving out onto the cloud, we have all of the lovely, lovely Google Apps products. So if you are a school, then you, get a, you can sign up for free for Google Apps for Education. You get control of all of the accounts that you set up there. You get control of exactly which apps they've got access to. Google do all of this for free, and unlike my Google account, they don't place any advertising on the school's accounts, which I think is really very good of them. So you've got email, you've got calendaring, you've got a brilliant little word processor, you've got a spreadsheet program, you've got a presentation program, you've got collaborative groups, you've got the ability to create websites, all of that for free from your friends at Google, your partners in search. It's such a good deal. You know, if I was doing the whole thing again now, this is exactly the way I would go as to, to providing this sort of infrastructure for the children, the young people in my school. And of course, because they're working on the web using these Google Docs sites, they've got access to these at home just as they have at school. So they can carry on on the same piece of work starting with that. The other lovely thing about the word process of spreadsheet PowerPoint, um, sorry, presentation <laughs> packages in there is that they're collaborative. You can have three, four, 30 children working on the same document 
at the same time, which is something which I don't think Microsoft Office has still yet cracked. It's such a lovely thing to be able to do. Okay, um, who here has got uh, Tesco's club card, Sainsbury's Nectar card, one of those sorts of things? Okay, you know why these, these things are good from their point of view, because they know what sort of customer they are, you are. They can target offers to you. That provides lots of information for them as a business. So you have this, all, this, this whole sort of data mining thing going on there. With my Amazon orders, Amazon's really good at saying, if you've enjoyed these books, then you're probably going to enjoy these books. I don't mind that. Does anybody in the room mind that sort of thing when Amazon do that for us? So what happens when we take that sort of idea and bring that into the classroom? Think of the amount of data generated by the children in your school. Think what, if you had the right software, you could do with that data. Children who struggle with these particular exercises will find this particular learning resource a really good one to have a look at next, perhaps. Or, some of the stuff which is going on with this sort of learning analytics, the children in our school who come from these particular postcodes do badly in exams unless we do specific interventions. There's so much information there. You know, talk to your head of maths, talk to you know, anybody in your school with a statistics qualification, and say, look, we've got all of this data. Can you come up with an interesting way of using this information to start intervening early, to look at the patterns, look at the trends that the data is showing, and start intervening before it becomes a problem? So the, the computer can spot that stuff earlier on. This particular package looks at assessment data. This is for matrix, um, and does that sort of data mining. It looks at the within school variation of saying, OK, these subjects, these teachers, this pattern of results, this subject, another story entirely, that's something which we perhaps need to have a conversation with those teachers about, or that teacher about. The blogging stuff, I was working with a school uh, down the road from us, and we're looking at some lovely little interesting programming packet, uh, project, they're calling it License to Tinker. The head says to me, well, we could have done blogging, that was the safe solution, that was the easy thing to do, because we're getting to the point now where children creating work online publishing that to the whole world. I remember when I was at primary school, the only person who read anything I... No, the only people who read anything I wrote were my teacher and my mum, really. We're at the point now where a child in year four, a child in year five, as you've got there, can write for a global audience of two billion people connected to the internet. OK, they're not going to get feedback from all two billion people, but what a wonderful sense of a purpose to a child's writing. It's not just because you've got to do some work. It's I'm writing for my public. Um, you have lovely things happening on blogs like this 100 word challenge thing. When you get back, Google 100 word challenge. And you'll see this lovely creative writing um, challenge week by week. Julia Skinner, former head teacher, sets children the country over this challenge of write 100 words about and gives them a title. And has then got a team of people who come in and read what children put and put comments on their blog. That sense of taking part in that sort of global, well, national community of children writing creatively with an audience, with some purpose, and listening to the feedback they get. I'm delighted about the feedback that they get. I've forgotten which slide I'm on. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, running your own web server is not nearly as scary as people would have you believe it is. You know, get, you know, take one of your old computers, or take a new computer, that's better still, and put Linux on there, put Apache on there, which is lovely web server software, MySQL, PHP. Once you've got those four things, all of which, by the way, are free, then you've got loads and loads of packages you can just download from the internet and do amazingly clever things with. So, school website, we used to use Drupal, a lot of the cool people use Joomla, you know, proper, you know, really sort of, you know, corporate feel to the thing, and brilliant content management system so you can distribute the work of creating the website amongst the whole team of people, people as much control of that as you want to. If you want to do the blogging thing, WordPress, world's favourite blog solution, there so that, again, you can control who writes the blogs, get the head teacher to write a blog, get the children to write their own blog, sharing it with the audience that you decide on. Skeptical about, me, uh, skeptical about Wikipedia? Run your own wiki. Why not put the policy documents onto a media wiki, wiki and then you don't have to spend any more staff meetings arguing about where the semicolon needs to go? Uh, Moodle, world's favourite virtual learning environment, which is what we're using at Roehampton. It's what I was using two schools ago when we were setting up this up to use with you know, 10, 11 year olds. So using it across a whole range of institutions, lesser known <coughs> things, customer relationship management. You know, how much of the stuff that you're doing with your database is actually a customer relationship management type function 
rather than you know, uh, uh, dealing with the sort of core nature of learning and teaching. Library catalogue if you want to, support ticket system for the IT help desk, or whatever, all of that there for free once you've got your own web server. You don't have to have it your side of the internet connection. You can go and sort of buy some virtual space out in the cloud there. Depends where you want the most access to it. If you're using it inside school, bring it your side of the firewall. If you want to provide lots of access to it outside of school, then it perhaps works better set out on the internet. Um, Ebook stuff, not sure about this. But, you know, if you're worried about the whole letting the children access the internet thing because they've got their iPads or their Google Books or whatever, and yet would still like to explore the sort of electronic resources approach, something like the Kindle provides access just to books. And that lack of distraction that you get with the Kindle, very, very nice idea. There are cost implications of this, and the licensing model is yet to settle down to a stable point. It's lots of different publishers and groups of publishers have their own way of doing ebook type solutions. So do explore, but possibly wait and see until the, the, the thing settles down and we're clear about actually where the market leader is going to be. Don't buy Betamax if BHS is going to be the winner, sort of thing. And then we get to the sort of gesture-based interfaces. Interactive whiteboards, yeah, yeah, we've kind of done that, Miles. What's going to be the next step? Well. Think about the sort of thing you can do with your Microsoft Connect plugged into the Xbox and bring that into the classroom. Why does it have to be a 72-inch screen that you're limited to? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to interact with any of that space within the room or at the front of the room? You know, being able to stand into, on the board and just sort of wave your arm in front of it might for some be a really appealing way of controlling what's happening on the board <laughs> rather than the sort of you know, thing which we've been doing for 150 odd years now, of taking the sort of thing which looks like a pen or a bit of chalk and putting it on the thing which looks a bit like a blackboard. I'm not sure whether this is real or a scam, but this is supposedly a leap motion box which may or may not be coming out at Christmas, priced at about $80, and it does the whole thing by magic as far as I can tell. Plugs into your computer and tracks where your fingers are in front of the screen by magic. I think it could be a scam to get loads of people's credit card numbers, but on the other hand, it could be for real, and it could be really, really amazing technology. But they're not telling us very much about how the technology works. But if it is real, um, you'll hear the stories about it come January, February next year, maybe at bet. You never know. Leap motions. Um, so yeah, so then we get to you know, things like GPS and the sort of thing which schools are doing with those. Now that we've got the GPS receivers built into our phones, if you're going to go the BYOD route, then all of the children are going to have, or many of the children, would have access to that sort of GPS technology. Think about the, the opportunities that that provides for the school trip. You could track where the children are with one of these things with the right sort of software set up on it. So a group of four children taking one GPS-enabled phone out between them, they can go and do their exploration, and you've got a record of where they are as they're doing it live. Why not, though, have them uploading photographs? You know, we did the school trip to France a few years ago now. What did we do? We took all of the photographs and uploaded those to our little private social networking space as we were doing the trip. So parents seeing exactly what the children were getting up to. What fun that was. And get the, the messages coming back from parents really involving them in that sort of school field trip. And lots and lots of opportunities. Oh, and the other thing is geocaching. Anybody doing geocaching? Spare time? Google geocaching when you get back. It's just such fun. So you need a GPS-enabled phone. You Get onto the website, it will tell you there are these secret chests of treasure around you. And you go with your phone and go and find the secret chests of treasure. Don't get too excited, the treasure is just sort of little trinkets and little sort of you know, key fobs and that sort of thing. But that sort of experience of going and, and finding something which has been left, laid hidden. You don't have to use the public stuff, you can do this inside you know, your school grounds using your own private collection. Um, QR codes scan this with the right sort of phone, it will take you to a website, uh, unless it is a challenge for you guys to figure out which website this is going to take you to. Um, that's an easy way of connecting children who are using this or the iPad or the other sorts of tablets to particular learning resources. So if you want to go that route, put one of those things on the big screen at the front of the room, everybody holds on their phone to it, everybody gets onto the website. None of that having to type in the whole sort of link thing there. Put them as stickers onto library books. Put them around your library. You know, and, and one of the ways, I think it's Glasgow University using these things as a way on their library catalogue of taking their students to where the book is hidden on the library shelves. But you know, why not, if you're working with very young children, put one of these, oops, put one of those things on the cover of the book, 
takes you to the audio file of somebody reading the book. It doesn't have to be a grown-up reading the book. It could be one of the children in year six reading the book for younger children further down the school. Go. Lecture casting was doing this back at St. Ives. That's two schools ago, 2005, 2006. Got the interactive whiteboard front of the room. Record what we did on that. It's a little flash movie. Put that onto the learning platform. The children who missed that lesson because they were poorly had a music lesson. In one girl's case was spending the term skiing in France. They could see the introductory bit of the lesson. They could catch up with the work that they'd missed. There was no excuse about it. I couldn't remember what we were doing when it comes to the homework. There. Doing this at Roehampton now, really, really easy ways of doing it. You just need a screen recorder, interactive whiteboard, and then a way of getting that out into the big bad world there. Put it onto the virtual learning environment. We're using YouTube as sort of private unlisted um, videos, so the only people who get the URL are those who should have been there. The opposite way round, record the lesson first and get them to watch it as homework before they come in. So most homework comes after the lesson. Do it the other way around. Do it as prep as we used to call it in the independent sector. Show them the thing which they're going to learn about and then you can spend the lesson, or your teachers can spend the lesson talking about the ideas rather than and discussing the problems and having a go at solving things rather than listening to you explaining things from the front of the room. Game-based learning, very, very in. The argument is children love playing games. They're very goal-orientated. There's all of that interactivity. They're getting all of that feedback. It's really quite hard. You know, typical primary school children, child, the, most hard, the hardest thing they do is not their school homework. It's getting through the next level of Angry Birds or whatever video game they happen to be playing. That's where the real challenge is coming in. James Paul Gee says, take these ideas from the games industry and apply those to the sorts of problems or apply those to the process of education. Lovely, lovely examples of schools that have got sets of Nintendo DSs or sort of more sort of um, plug into a monitor type video games and doing really creative things which look very much like learning, not the sort of drill and practice that most educational games are. They're really engaging with this virtual environment of the game. Whole opportunities for user generated content. We talked about blogging already, but getting children to do those walkthroughs, to record their explanation of something and uploading that to YouTube for one another to see. Getting children to upload photographs of what they're learning to a private account on Flickr or better still to somewhere on your school hosted blog. Getting children to not, only not read Wikipedia, which is fine, really it is, but to contribute to Wikipedia. Hard to do with the main big English Wikipedia, but if you go to simple.wikipedia.org you've got a version of Wikipedia written for people who are learning English, which is kind of most of the children that we have in school. You also have the other language versions of Wikipedia. Simple.wikipedia.org is not finished yet. It's the sort of thing which primary school children, secondary school children could contribute to rather than just take information from. <coughs> Making things is really good. This is an Arduino. It looks a bit like a Raspberry Pi, but it does Five minutes. Oh, we've got plenty of time then. Okay, it does all of the things which the it does none of the things which the Raspberry Pi does. You can't plug one of these into a TV, but it will work on its own. So you can get it controlling little robots or little lights or reacting to things on the internet. Lovely, lovely examples here of year what is it? Seven, eight-year-olds working at home with Arduinos, hacking their toys apart putting little robots, put, putting little motors, putting little lights inside their soft toys and having them controlled. You know, somebody, somebody comes close to the soft toy, the Arduino makes it sort of wave its arms or eyes light up or whatever. Um, and then the ICT curriculum itself. You know what's happening to the ICT curriculum? Oh, well done. Could you explain? <laughs> okay. What we have for the next two years, a wonderful opportunity. The Secretary of State has been convinced that the ICT program of study as it stands, as its programs of study as they stand, are not fit for purpose. I'm not sure that that's an entirely accurate assessment. There you go. So he's saying, for the next two years, schools can choose to do whatever they want. They still have a statutory duty to teach ICT, but what that program of study is, is going to be entirely up to them for the next couple of years. Come 2014, there'll be another much more slimmed down statutory program of study for the three schools that have not yet converted to academies by 2014, I suspect. Remember that if you're in an academy, free school, independent school, you have autonomy over your curriculum anyhow. So the freedoms which are granted through the disapplication come to all schools. Could go either way. You know, it's, there are going to be two sorts of schools here. There are going to be schools who say, well, if we don't have to do anything, let's just do the usual sort of find things out on the internet, make a PowerPoint presentation, that'll be enough, won't it? And then there will be schools that take this freedom and do really exciting, really creative things, doing sort of computing, programming stuff that the Secretary of State 
and Eric Schmidt and Ian Livingstone and Steve Ferber are hoping schools are going to do with the opportunities they're given. One of the reasons why that bit matters is this notion of it's not so much about ICT skills, it's about computing, it's about computational thinking is a different way of thinking about the world. Those who've got an experience of writing software, of writing computer programs, of knowing about computer science, think about problems differently. Talk to your ICT teachers or talk to you know, the, the ICT teachers who've got a background in computing about where the problems are in your school. You know, what's, you know, where are the workflow holdups? Where are the things where actually everybody has to come to a grinding halt because it's not an efficiently designed algorithm that you as an institution are following? Are there ways of streamlining things? And I would argue that the folks who've got some background in, compu in computational thinking, in computer science, have real insights into that sort of, this is not an efficient system. We can make this more efficient by looking at it different ways. And then we come to critical digital literacy. The digital literacy stuff, you know, how can I find things on the internet? How can I create something for other people to see? How can I keep myself safe online? All of that, you know, kind of assumed now. But I think there is a place for children, for young people, for teachers, for us, being more critical about that and thinking, okay, how does Google place these results into order? What is it that Google makes? How does Google decide what result comes up at the top of the page? How is Google actually making money? You know, who here actually clicks on the sponsored links, the green adverts, the things at the top or at the side? Anybody? So who is? You know, how can they be making all of this money? None of the people I've ever talked to have said, yeah, yeah, I click on those things all of the time. That's strange, isn't it? So the formula on the screen behind me is PageRank. It's the, the heart of Google's algorithm for putting results in order. But you know, the critical digital literacy question is, why do we rely on Google for this? Is there anybody in the room who uses a search engine other than Google as their default option? Never since the Reformation has one institution controlled more people's access to information than Google do now. Shouldn't we be a little more critical about our engagement with that? The coding stuff is cool, and there are really, really nice ways of doing that. So Scratch, if you're not using, or if your children, teachers aren't using Scratch already, get them to have download the thing. It's free, and it's brilliant, and it's a lovely way for really, really young children, sort of year one, year two, up to uh, Stanford are using a variant of Scratch with their undergraduates, so the Open University now. So what is it? Uh, low, low floors, high ceiling, wide walls. Plenty of opportunity for people to do really creative things. Want well, to start de developing your own apps for a mobile phone. MIT's app inventor. I could kind of teach it to people in year six, year seven. You know, this is not something beyond the realms of possibility for the teachers in your school, for the children in your school to do. And if you want to learn how to code, then there are lovely online resources like Code Academy to do that. Loads and loads of open access online content. There's so much information there. So, you know, a child now, now, okay, a child who can read, a child who's got access to the internet, and most importantly, a child who is sufficiently well motivated can teach themselves pretty much anything these days. Here is a course about how to design your own search engine. Okay, it's a little bit challenging, but if you're sufficiently well motivated, you'd cope with this. The slides I've not had time to show you. Badger's really interesting approach to assessment. Get your teachers to talk to one another and talk to people in other schools. You don't have to pay so much for the training courses because they've got so many brilliant ideas themselves. Google Teach Meet, <coughs> personal learning networks, the connections we make matter so much more than the courses we go on, the things that with the qualifications we have. And that is really too much information, isn't it? Because of this ubiquitous access to in technology, to information, we need downtime, we need time to turn our Blackberries, etc off and live back in an analog world. Thank you very, very much. I'm sorry there's no time for questions, but I'll hang around if there are things you want to talk about. <laughs> Thank you.